Glad you all spread out. <laughs> I don't have to be this loud, do I? Okay, good. <laughs> I just might be naturally loud anyways. Excellent. Um, let's uh, put that down. and Have a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, get into today. Let's pray. Uh, Father, God, we uh, invite you into this time into this space, into our lives. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for um, being here today. We thank you, Lord, for uh, getting up, for changing of times, but uh, adjusting to that as well. Thank you, Lord, for your sunshine, for your creation. And we thank you, Lord, for each other. Give us your blessing this morning, Lord, as we delve into your word, as we fellowship and as we study and as we worship together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The weather must be very infectious. Everybody must be sick with sunshine. <laughs> They're not here. <laughs> what do we got? Eight? <laughs> Two, four, six, eight. Yeah, it is nine. Sorry, Janet. <laughs> Ten, Kenny. Good. Well, uh, um, so I have the whiteboard here today, and and I wanted to to just do loop around a little bit uh, with with our purposes, uh, why we're here, what we're doing, um, and then get into um, uh, uh, what's what's next. What we talked about um, a couple weeks ago. So so. Why are we uh, doing this study? Why are we studying spiritual gifts? Why are we taking this uh, strategy to, to, to do this? We uh, uh, predicated on um, uh, December 27th to, to the significance, understand the significance of, of these spiritual giftings, the significance of the scriptures that are related to these spiritual giftings and the significance that, uh, for us. Uh, the significance for us is learning how these spiritual gifts are applicable, how they are lived out, how they are practiced by ourselves individually and, and, and corporate, corporately, and, and, and the significance of making this clear or much more clear and making us much more aware of the uniqueness of our design as God has created each and every one of us. So our goals, as pastor leadership team set the goals, the main priority is for us as individuals to understand what our spiritual giftings are. Redemptive gift, uh, um, manifestational gift, and if we serve in a spiritual office, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, and the second priority then is for the congregation to understand I wrote down, fully understand uh, its uh, redemptive or motivational gift. Uh, this is the French would say, raison d'etre, reason for being, and to live into that as the bride of Christ. So, so here's the thing about that. You know, um, comparisons are human nature. Why can't we be like so-and-so? Why can't we be like them over there. Why can't we be like? It's because we're not them. We are us. Each body of Christ was distinctly created for a distinct and special purpose. And it's us to understand and discern what that purpose is. That purpose is off of our motivational or redemptive gift for being. And, and as, as we talked about last week, as we uh, are, are fulfilling that dominant redemptive gift, we, as we spiritually mature, we lean into and practice in some ways the other six redemptive gifts, uh, um, sort of rounding out who we are as we are created. So that's individually and corporately. And a sign of spiritual maturity is the ability to live into these other 
uh, spiritual gifts, uh, redemptive gifts, um, as, as, as well as uh, our motivational or redemptive gift. So, so for us to understand who we are as uh, a bride of Christ, specifically put here for a specific reason, and then leading out from that is, is, is a high priority, in, in my opinion. So, uh, and to compare ourselves to any other church or bride of Christ is, is unfair and ineffective because they are who God created them to be. We need to be who God created us to be. So there's uh, another take on the importance of this sort of thing. So, um, yeah, to continue on, to have this knowledge, we can be a lot more effective uh, in living and ministering individually, having this knowledge about ourselves and corporately, uh, to, to live and serve out of our giftedness. Uh, we understand better God's plans and purposes, not only for ourselves individually and corporately, but for our uh, purposes and plans within the community. And then uh, the next leaders coming in to have the clarity of understanding of who this faith body is can lead way more effectively out of that uh, dominant motivational or redemptive gift. Well, with this knowledge is the opportunity and ability to improve uh, relationships. And that's not just within, but it's also without as, as well. So we, we're talking about the biblical foundation for these uh, giftings, uh, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and today we're going to talk about Ephesians 4. Um, and uh, I mentioned before some Greek, <laughs> uh, the, the, the Greek words used in, um, or a specific word I should say used in Ephesians is diakonia or diakonia and which uh, the word deacon comes out of that uh, Greek word, the English word deacon. Uh, uh, diakonia or diak diakonia is service. It means service, ministry, support, and it's a reference to a spiritual office. So in, in Acts, when the deacons were created, they were given a spiritual office within the faith body, and they served with that spiritual authority out of that. So um, this is, and then the physical office of deacon eventually, you know, was, was created. So our redemptive, um, the foundation for, um, where do I want to go next? Yeah, now we're, we're just going to move on to, um, to, to Ephesians there. Um, well, I do want to lay out, correct, I do want to lay out Remember, I had my little pattern of stepping stones. Okay, um, and this is where Ken says, "Are you going to talk about uh, Sunday adult Sunday adult discipleship training Sunday school?" So we're going to go through the scriptures. That's an S. <laughs> S scriptures. Okay, which is Romans. 1 Corinthians and Ephesians. Um, and then we're going to take a little bit of a break um, and, and get back into um, our weekly Bible study lessons. Um, when, and we're going to actually give time. Um, I want to, I want, during, during that time, while we're doing the, the congregational survey and the listening sessions, which are coming up, I want to give time for any comments during Sunday, during Sunday school uh, while we're doing um, our, our regular Bible study, ADT, Adult Discipleship Training, okay? Um, so we're going to give space for that as well. Um, once we get that completed um, and we're waiting for data to be compiled and, and collected, uh, once that is done, then we'll get back into the discussion of the individual redemptive gift, individual redemptive gift. 
that's a G. Okay, uh, we're going to study each one, all seven of them, one at a time, however long that takes. Uh, and we're going to uh, work on learning that on an individual perspective. And then after that, uh, after that will be on the corporate perspective. Corporate. That's an A. There it is. And we'll learn that on the corporate level. And once all of that is done, then we'll go back into our weekly Bible study um, plan. Okay, so... Uh, all of that being said, we're stepping up into this uh, learning and understanding. All that being said, if we get through Ephesians today, um, then the next couple of Sundays, uh, March 21 and March 28, we will be doing our, our weekly Bible study. I will be doing those two Sundays, okay? Uh, and then uh, Easter Sunday, there is no uh, Sunday school because of Easter, and then, um, and then back to, this. Will, so this is the 21st, 21st, 28th, and then April 11. Uh, most likely will be uh, three Sundays where we do the weekly Bible study, okay? We'll have those lessons. Um, and uh, then we'll, we'll see where we're at with regards to uh, the survey and the listening sessions. Um, that might continue on a couple of Sundays in April. Um, and then uh, until we have that information, it won't, we won't be able to pinpoint that exact date go, coming back to studying the, each individual redemptive gift. So just, just a heads up on that. So, um, yeah, and I'll have to be in con conversation with Ken about, uh, about the teacher for after April 11, who, who's going to be teaching next. And for the time being as well, we'll still gather together in the sanctuary uh, for uh, social distancing uh, during adult discipleship training. So, okay, uh, if you have any questions about that, let me know, but this is the, the plan that we're following for the time being. All right, so Ephesians 4, uh, verses 11 through um, 13 are, are the scriptures for today. Should be familiar. So Paul here, he's in chapter 4. Uh, he's talking about the unity uh, in the body. Uh, we've talked about that several different times, several different ways, um, different messages here and there, uh, Sunday school, etc. So these things should be somewhat familiar. Uh, but, the, but the specific verses are, are this, they state this. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining uh, to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And so we talked about this last week as, as well uh, from the pulpit. Uh, so um, all that being said, maybe I need to go back. Let's start at, chap at, uh, at the beginning of chapter um, four. Um, with Paul uh, writing to the Ephesians. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. These are the ones I kind of highlighted last Sunday. Making every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to. One hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all. all who is over all, through all, and in all. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. It's kind of really clear there, something happened. Jesus ascended 
gifts descended. Gifts were given to men. Jesus ascended. The Holy Spirit was gifted. A counselor was gifted by way of the Holy Spirit, by way of the counselor. We have the manifestational gifts as well. These gifts were given to men. So what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? That's, you know, when he was born of the Virgin Mary. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he, as in he, Jesus. Okay. So we have that bit of knowledge and information and scripture and holy teaching. So Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 lists the spiritual offices or another term might be governmental gifts. Governmental spiritual gifts. This is an operation or operating out of a spiritual authority. Uh, These spiritual offices or governmental gifts are for the benefit and the maturity of the body of Christ, which is the church. And the purpose of the church is what? Is to share and reveal the gospel, the good news, the salvation for people to have the opportunity to to choose Jesus for themselves. Paul describes these roles as being uh, established to build up the body of Christ for the growth in spiritual maturity and for the growth in Christ-likeness. And these uh, five offices are pastor, prophet, teacher, evangelist, and apostle. At the inception of, uh, our inception of ourselves, in, when we are born, as we are conceived, not born, conceived first, and then birth is followed, we ha- have, we are given this redemptive or this motivational, this dominant gift. And then by way of the Holy Spirit, we uh, can ask for and be given manifestational gifts, gifts that are manifested because of the Holy Spirit in us. Each one of us has been given special gifts for the purpose of building up the church. So here's the bottom line. Everything is about building up the church. Why? The church is the vehicle that shares the gospel. Okay, Everything is about building up the church. You're given a gift at inception so that you can have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and build up his church. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you will not use that gift for good or for building up the church, for that matter. But you will use that gift. That's how you were created to use that gift. And you certainly won't be developing any kind of form of spiritual maturity in in, in, uh, trying to use the the six other redemptive gifts as well. Coming into saving grace and life eternal through Jesus Christ, that gift is redeemed. It is redeemed. It is saved for the purpose of building up Christ's church. That should be one of our strongest motivations for gathering, for being, and for sharing the gospel and for serving. That anything that we do should be out of that motivation. Once we have received God's grace and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we can and we should be putting our special gifts to that specific purpose. It's called being intentional. Very intentional for the purpose of building up the church. A sign of spiritual maturity is the using of these gifts for that specific task of building up the church. Uh, We are to use these gifts to help uh, guide and direct the building of the church. Our leaders are divinely called to serve then 
out of these spiritual offices based on their spiritual gifts and their calling into these spiritual offices. And it's not just professionals. So what do I mean by professionals? I'm a professional. <laughs> Some people would laugh at that. <laughs> it's funny, it's okay. Uh, I get paid to be a pastor. That's professional. I'm not talking about, oh, I am talking about that, but I'm more specifically talking about also lay leadership. Professional pastoring is not a biblical construct. That is a man-made construct for man's convenience. I'm talking about lay leaders. Lay leaders are called to serve out of these spiritual offices in their spiritual giftings, their redemptive gift, their manifestational gifts. Okay? <clears throat> so uh, we all, as, as we are called to serve in, in, within the church, uh, should be discerning what our spiritual office is. Some commentaries suggest that for the building up of the church, the order of the spiritual offices as they were written were important and deliberate. And as you see in the scripture, they are written in this order. Number one is apostle. Number two is prophet. Number three is evangelist. Number four is pastor. And number five is teacher. There, the suggestions from the commentaries are, and these are guys that are smarter than I am, that... Um, there's a reason that this order was written. So if you look at that list, somebody tell me what you think is actually actually living out right now, what's number one? In church life, which spiritual uh, uh, office is, is number one? Is that order, as lit, written, uh, listed in Scripture, is that what is actually true today? Is that what is being lived out today? If I'm not leading you enough, go ahead, Jean. Okay, well, <laughs> I have that, yes. Hold on, uh, Jeff, were you going to say something? Okay. Not yet. It, it, you, yeah, it appears to be in reverse order, yeah. So, uh, so the fivefold ministries is what we're referring to, these spiritual offices. Um, so let's go ahead and do that then, Jerry. Let's talk about what the, what the, the, the definitions are. So... Um, here we are, uh, we have this description of these um, fivefold, um, I could go through the Greek, I don't think the Greek's going to matter to us right now at this point in time. Okay, so apostles are sent by God on specific missions to specific groups of people. The word apostle was taken from the Roman concept of one sent on a specific high level mission with the authority of the government official who sent him. So quite often, in, in, historically speaking, uh, if someone had an important missive, message, something, a task or, or message to give, they will have uh, it written down and there will be a seal of that official. So ultimately, uh, for many, the, the seal of Caesar in, in Roman times or further on in, um, in, in the, after Roman times would be the king's seal indicates the importance of the mission or the uh, and or the message so this this uh, the apostle is the one sent to deliver uh, this very specific uh, message on this as they say high level mission uh, the ap apostles are groundbreakers and trailblazers making a way for the new things of God for the people to whom they are assigned uh, the uh, they walk in a lot of favor to accomplish this, but they can often suffer persecution because of the groundbreaking aspect to their calling. 
In 2 Corinthians, it lists the demonstration of signs, wonders, and miracles as a marker of someone with the gift of apostle. Apostles' missions are unique, but may include responsibilities like teaching truth, as, as for Peter, for example. He's Apostle Peter, but he, he served in the office of apostle, but he also did a lot of teaching. Uh, and then um, uh, launching new ministries, new church fellowships. Paul is an example of that and um, other things as well. So apostles come with the authority of Christ to see things accomplished. How does that help? Yeah. Okay, so that, well, I get, should I just continue to go through them? Uh, I don't, I mean, it's going to be a lot of information. I don't want to um, muddle it up, but so then the definition of prophets. Prophets expect, express the heart of the mind, and the will of God uh, to the people, either by bringing God's word to a specific situation or telling the future. The purpose of the prophet's messages are to bring truth and clarity, but also encourage... Wow, where is that sun coming from? Wow. But also encouragement, as in the example of Judas and Silas in Acts. Uh, Acts 15 specifically. They oft, are often uh, known in Scripture for the amount of time they spend in the presence of God hearing his voice. They may be asked to perform prophetic acts as part of the messages they are bringing from the Lord, such, uh, um, well, Agabus tied his uh, uh, hands and feet uh, with his own hands and feet with Paul's belt, Acts 21. Um, uh, yeah, et cetera. Prophets may experience persecution because the truth from God that they bring is not always what people want to hear. <laughs> Think about John the Baptist in that uh, way. The dude literally lost his head, etc. Okay. Evangelist. Uh, messenger of good news. Uh, evangelists spread the gospel message and equip and encourage other believers to do the same. Uh, Philip is an evangelist. He's the first one we, come, we encounter, essentially, um, as he's um, on the way to... Where was Philip going? I blanked. Somebody tell me later. Okay, I'll, f I'll figure it out later. Philip was on his way. He met a eunuch, Ethiopian eunuch. There you go. Okay. Anyway, and then the Lord plucked him away from there and put him somewhere else. Yeah, the first evangelist, he got to tell about the good news by relating Isaiah. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Evangelist. Um, um, Philip not only, pre for example, Philip not only preached the gospel, but he also performed signs and wonders, inclu including casting out demons and healing the sick, uh, which confirmed his message of the redemptive and healing work of Christ on the cross. This also then gave uh, credibility, or even greater credibility, to his role as an evangelist. So, so you see in, in these descriptions already the, the playing of these gifts working together in the, in the operation of themselves out of these spiritual offices. Uh, da, 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 da. Evangelists may bring the gospel message to one person or to large groups of people. So pastor, or another term would be shepherd. Uh, they're related to biblical elders uh, leading a specific group or flock of sheep. They provide care, protection, and boundaries. While there are no specific people mentioned in the New Testament as filling uh, the fivefold ministry role of, pa of pastor or shepherd, then, but from the information we have in the, in the scriptures, we can glean an understanding of what a pastor or shepherd may be called to do in his or her office uh, by looking at Jesus, who is the ultimate, the good shepherd, and the role of the elders of the early church. Pastors uh, or shepherds will likely focus on the spiritual maturity of the flock, teaching sound doctrine and refuting false doctrine. They may minister, minister healing to the sick through prayer and anointing. They are led and um, they are to lead and to live uh, loving, righteous examples, lives of loving, righteous examples of what it means to follow Jesus, uh, laying down their sheep just as 
Real shepherds lay down their sheep for their flocks, and as Christ did. And then the teacher, the teacher is a master of the word of God, bringing greater uh, knowledge of and clarity to the scriptures while they may teach just one person or a large group of people. A person in the office of teacher is especially gifted to teach the scriptures in a master-apprentice-styled relationship the way Jesus taught the disciples. In fact, um, let's say the Greek word is mostly used to describe Jesus who often taught uh, by using parables that invited the listener to ask questions. Okay. Uh, what else do we want to say? Uh, the teacher not only teaches the knowledge of God in his word, but also calls the students to greater maturity as well in their own walks, in their own relationship with the Lord. Um, they do this, uh, the teacher sort of turns like a mentor uh, in, in, in asking probing questions about their relationship uh, with God uh, for them to learn how to grow in that relationship with God. Da, 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 da. What else? Extra stuff here. Um, throughout the New Testament, the believers were warned to guard against false teaching that might lead them astray into sin. Teachers are extremely influential, um, and, and we can see as the examples of the teachers of the law, <laughs> and it is important that they are accurate and above reproach in their office. So as, as I read through these uh, offices, uh, these, this fivefold ministry, uh, to me... I don't know if you saw it or as well, but there seems to be an order, as I mentioned before, uh, an order or a process. We have here a process. Um, I think it's being revealed as these different uh, offices are described. And the first one then is apostle. So out of all of that, what was the emphasis of what the apostle does? Okay. Start new things is one example. A very, very basic foundational perspective of the uh, apostle and serving out of the office of apostle. And then the, what's one other thing? Carries the message or delivers the message. You don't mind if I use deliver? Okay, thanks. Now, I don't, I want to emphasize, I don't, I'm not going to write it down, emphasize they have the authority to carry or deliver this message. That spiritual office, they're operating out of that authority for carrying or delivering this message. So just keep this in mind. How can someone pastor or be a pastor of a flock that doesn't even have the message yet? That's quite a conundrum, isn't it? So this is why I think we have this order. So one, and then two, was what? Prophet. What does the prophet do? He speaks God's word. That's simple enough and accurate enough as well. God's word, nobody else's word. How can a person lead a flock of sheep <laughs> if they don't know uh, or have heard yet what God's word is? So I think we're kind of discovering here a little bit of the importance of why this order is this order. And uh, I, were you going to say something, Jeff? About the prophet, uh, I'm taking a class in the picture. For some reason, in our culture, in our time, we have pigeonholed prophets in one segment of speaking God's word. And I heard it explained this way because it really opens up to me. A prophet is really a fourth teller or a fourth teller. There's a difference. Some reason we have everything as a, as a fourth 
Do we have any clue if that's going to be heard? Was he close enough to any kind of mic, Delmar? Probably not. Okay. So just for the purposes of the, yeah, <laughs> I forgot to get the mic out anyways. So for the purposes of, of the recording, uh, uh, Jeff's uh, seminary studies um, uh, was demonstrated uh, and learned that the, 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 the office of prophet or in the role of prophet uh, serves two ways in the foretelling of God's word or the forth telling of God's word. And the difference is, forth telling is telling God's word in the now, in the present. Uh, and foretelling is in uh, uh, telling God's word of the future. And we as humans have put limits on the office of and role of prophet in only uh, allowing them, if you will, is that fair to say? Allowing them to serve in the role of foretelling or just telling the future and, and we do not give them enough uh, opportunity space and credibility even that would be my word uh, credibility even of telling a forth telling telling God's word for the here and the now uh, and I would and I would uh, not hesitate to say that um, uh, what happened on December 27th in Adam's uh, spiritual gifting and redemptive gifting of prophet was a forth telling as well as the potential for foretelling of our future. Um, okay, uh, any more questions about that? So the, the third one, the third role, or third uh, spiritual office then, is what? Evangelist. Okay, are, are you seeing the pattern here now the emphasis on the first three is all about somehow receiving the word of God. Pastor and teacher can't serve without having the word of God given and accepted first. And our doctrine has reversed that. And it's a real struggle to find our way back to that. I'm just saying that, I mean, that's across, the, that's across the evangelical church. Those with the redemptive gift of, sorry, the manifestational gift of apostle, serving out of the office of apostle, are somewhat loose cannons. Status quo doesn't like loose cannons. So these are a little bit more controlled down here. There's a little bit of more comfort in that, that they can be more controlled. These, all these three are a lot more loose cannons and they're a lot more um, not that they're not spirit filled but the spirit Holy Spirit in them is a lot looser <laughs> it's a lot more yeah there's less boundaries uh, in how the spirit is expressed that's why there's a lot of comfort in that and this pref uh, preference has led to professionals Okay. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying this is where we're at. Okay. And there's a reason that these offices are labeled and placed in this order. Okay. They're prioritized. And we've changed the priorities, humanly speaking. Okay, <laughs> that's a bit of a 
newness, I think, for us, but this is where we are. Yes, sir. So, yeah, uh, I mentioned the comfort part. Yes, as Jeff just mentioned, this, this priority of this as leadership, uh, it creates a maintenance mode, just a maintaining of the status quo as opposed to a growth uh, mode or, or, or direction because all of these are about sharing the word of God, delivering the message of the good news in some way, shape, or form so that those who haven't heard it yet have a chance to receive it. Once they received it, then, then these leaders come into play. Okay, this is where the growth takes place. These guys are about maintaining what's already been established. This is about establishing with the knowledge and the word of the good news. You want to say anything more about that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, if, if this is if this is all he, who you want to lead, this is this the, there will be no growth. It's just it's just not going to occur. That's not in their uh, uh, nature, generally speaking. That the, the the purpose of this spiritual office, talking about just spiritual offices, is not about growth. It's about the main, maintenance of what's already there. So let me give you a little bit of insight um, into the conference at a conference level. We, well, you should know, uh, if you didn't already, that we have three bishops uh, overseeing our district. Our district is 18 churches. The district name has changed. We're not Weaverland District anymore because the region that we represent is far greater. We're Mountain Valley District because we represent churches of LMC in the mountains and the valleys. Um, Fantastic name. So anyway, here's the point. There's three. Each one serves out of a spiritual different office and has a different motivational or redemptive gift. That's called a team. The church or the district represented by 18 churches has a better chance of being served and grow because of the combination of the spiritual offices serving in leadership. The conference is deliberately looking at providing team leadership for all of the districts where these things are reflected and not just one person which is limited. Okay, so we're not, <laughs> we're, this is not just something just for us. This is a revelatory on a conference level. And they're working from the top down and how to be more representative more accurately representative of the body of Christ as laid out in the Bible. Okay, so uh, <laughs> we're trying to get back to the beginning, okay, not recreate it with these new learnings or re-education. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's I didn't expect to, shared that about the conference, but I mean, it's quite appropriate, I think, where we're, where we're sitting right now with this understanding of these spiritual offices. So, I mean, as I was, if you didn't realize, anybody want to guess what my, where my spiritual office is? <laughs> uh, apostle, quite frankly. Uh, I, 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 yeah, that's going to be hard for me to change that. And, and if just... If I just reread the description, literally my five and a half years here has been literally this. I've been living this out, literally. So, uh, um, yeah, uh, we just see it play out. I mean, we just see these things played out in our recent history. Uh, you know, even Adam serving out of, out of 
that spiritual office as well, for example. So um, this stuff is real. This stuff is phenomenal. And it's for us to grasp and then live into uh, on all three, with, with, within all three, redemptive gift, manifestational gift, and spiritual offices. Okay, I did hear the first buzzer, so I want to let time if there's any questions or comments that we want to have or ask. As we um, then, so yeah, if there isn't any need or urge to continue with the, the dwelling in these three scriptures, then the next few Sundays we're going to be, oh, I took it off, we're going to be in our weekly Bible study for this time, okay? Um, and then we will get back to the individual um, redemptive gifts. We'll study each one, all seven of them, individually. And in that process, um, the hope and prayer is that you rediscover or discover for the first time what your redemptive or motivational gift is, and then uh, we'll look at that in, in a corporate level. So that's, that's the direction we're going. And for the next few Sundays, we'll be in uh, regular weekly Bible study talking about the scriptures um, that we've been reading through the week. Any questions about that? Very good. Let's have a word of prayer, then we'll break for, uh, and prepare for the service. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for your diversity of gifting. Uh, we pray, Lord, that we can be the best uh, part of your body, the church, that we can be, Heavenly Father, with these understandings, with these learnings. And help us, Lord, to live into those to the best of our ability to serve you and to serve uh, your church, Heavenly Father, in this community. Thank you, God, for those that are here, uh, for uh, attentiveness and listening. Pray, Lord, your blessing upon each and every one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.